That's better. Okay, thank you, thank you absolutely for um, for having me um, tonight. And um, as as you've heard, I'm I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist working at the Montana Hospital. Um, but I think that especially if you're thinking about a career in surgery, what you really need to know is that that you always work in a team. And so that's why on the on the first slide that I really put put a picture of the team up, and you see there is a lot of people involved, and that's that's just a, a small part of our team. But you're always working in an environment with um, nurses, other physicians, um, allied health. And, and really when you're, when you're looking for a job, what I would probably want to add to, to Andrea's suggestions already is um, look for a team that you feel comfortable in and look for a group of people that you like to work with. And ultimately the job that you then do is, is much less important um, if the people around you support you and, and, and if, you, if you get along well with, with the rest of your team. And that's certainly the the case um, for me. Now, I'm, I'm lucky enough um, that, uh, that on top of that, I, I get to do a job that, uh, that I love. Um, and I get to share my time a little bit between um, prenatal diagnosis and fetal therapy and research. And that's, again, um, I think one of, the, one of the things that I would recommend everybody to look for because it keeps your job challenging and interesting. And you'll always be working at, at the forefield of, of what you're doing. And and by doing research, you, you answer really important questions and, and you make sure that, that, that you get the answers to the questions that have not been answered yet. Um, now, even though I would like to say that I'm, that I'm a fetal surgeon, I'm not really a fetal surgeon, um, or at least not, not for the majority of my time. And my, the main part of my job is really doing um, prenatal diagnosis because you can treat without, without a diagnosis and getting your diagnosis right is, uh, is extremely important, especially when you're, when you're talking about fetal conditions and delicate conditions. So um, in, in, in clinical practice, um, my time is spent three days a week um, doing, doing ultrasounds um, and then um, one day uh, for procedures typically and, and one day for um, on, on research. Um, now, Prenatal diagnosis has advanced tremendously over the, over the past 10 years, 10, 15 years. And where initially a fetus looked like a little gray bleb on a, on a black screen, we can now get really exquisite detail and we can see uh, fetuses in, in really high resolution. And these are um, the pictures that you see here on the screen are, are just a few examples of, of what we can do now with 2D and 3D ultrasound. And, and most developed countries have now instituted really good screening programs where you start um, looking at in detail at the fetus from early pregnancy on from from even 10 12 weeks onwards and where you can diagnose fetal abnormalities early um, that has enabled parents to make decisions in their pregnancies some will choose to stop a pregnancy some will choose to have further investigations and some will choose to intervene on fetuses and um, the further investigations that I'm alluding to is um, in clinical practice now, a lot of genetic investigations. And so when you're able to make a diagnosis early, you can really kind of work that fetus up and, and look um, whether a fetal anomaly is, is what we call isolated or whether it's associated with, with other genetic abnormalities. And if you, if you have an isolated um, fetal condition that in many cases that is um, treatable um, surgically, if it's associated with genetic abnormalities, um, in many cases that would not qualify for, for fetal surgery. Now, when we're, treating, when we're treating isolated conditions and conditions that need surgery, we usually prefer to treat these fetuses after birth when they're babies, when they're neonates, um, because um, treating in utero certainly comes with um, important drawbacks and you need to overcome the mom sitting around the fetus um, so you've, you've got an, an additional layer of complexity um, and you need to overcome the problems of preterm birth, which is still the Achilles heel of most of our fetal surgeries because we access the, the uterus, we make a hole in the, in the membranes and in the myometrium and, and we thereby increase the risk of preterm birth and certainly for very vulnerable babies who, all, who already need a surgery, if on top of that they're born preterm, that certainly complicates things. So. So for, some, for most conditions, we would try to treat them after birth, but some conditions are extremely progressive and, and cause um, the neonate to be severely distressed and therefore we, we try to intervene before it gets to that stage. So we, we try to stop the progression of a condition. 
and for other con and other conditions result in a fetal death and then obviously we try to intervene before that has happened to to avert that death from happening and we've basically got three types of fetal therapy now you're not here to hear about transplacental therapy because that's very easy we give medication to the mom that medication crosses the placenta and then treats the fetus um, you probably have heard about steroids to mature babies' lungs when they're born preterm. We give antiarrhythmics for babies with um, cardiac rhythm disorders. Um, and then we have a few newer medications such as antiviral medications, serolimus or indometacin for, for specific conditions. But that's not, that's not very fancy and that's not what you wanted to hear tonight um, because any internal medicine person can do that. And um, the, the fancy stuff that, that we like to do um, is um, basically minimally invasive or open fetal surgery. Now let's start maybe a little bit about minimal invasive procedures. And I've just um, taken a few examples from, from our portfolio just to give you a sense of, of what is available. And our minimally invasive procedures are typically split up in needle-based procedures and fetoscopic procedures. And the needle-based procedures, I, I've, I've shown you two examples here are ultrasound guided techniques. So what you see on the, on the left of the screen here is a, is a cross section of a fetal chest. And you see that this fetus has an effusion in the chest. So that's a, a fetal hydrothorax, a, a pleural effusion in the fetus, which is a relatively common, um, common finding. And the problem of that condition is that if you leave it untreated, that the fluid buildup in the chest becomes so expansive that it results in heart failure because of compression of the heart or that the lungs get significantly compressed. And so what we do in utero is insert these little shunts, basically a toracoamniotic shunt, and little tubes that drain the, the fluid sitting in the chest to the amniotic cavity. And you can see here um, in the bottom clip how, how, that is, um, how that is done. So you see here a fetal chest with the heart and the black space here is the, the pleural effusion. Um, you can see how, how the lungs are basically Yes, we try not to stick it in the heart. And, and then um, we push that little shunt tube um, in so that the, the water can come out. Um, on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, um, I've put a picture of, uh, of an even um, um, scarier procedure. It's basically a um, um, fetal aortic valve dilatation. So in fetuses with um, a critical aortic stenosis, um, the um, the disease basically results in a progressive evolution to a hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And um, because the, when the aorta is critically stenotic, you don't get any filling in the, in the left ventricle and the left ventricle basically collapses and doesn't grow. And so if we can intervene in the early stage of the disease where the ventricle is very ballooned and insert a needle into the heart and then pass the little balloon over that or through that needle, through the aortic valve and open up the aortic valve, Is from ending up with a, with a single ventricle and a hypoplastic left heart, um, thereby allowing it to have a biventricular repair after birth and not, not going down the route of a, of a Fontan circulation. Um, so these are, these are two of our um, needle-based procedures. What do we do fetoscopically? Fetoscopically, we um, mainly do interventions on the placenta. And what you can see here is um, a, a picture of Twin, twin transfusion syndrome where two fetuses are sharing one placenta and the fetuses are connected at the level of the placenta with vascular anastomosis. Connecting at the level of the placenta. Dr. Van Meegen, sorry to interrupt, but your audio is cutting in and out. Would you mind if we stopped your video and hopefully that'll okay. uh, resolve yeah. the issue? Does that work better? Yeah. And I can stop my own video also. Let me have a look here. Oh. Yeah, can you hear me better now? Yes, hopefully it'll last. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so we've got these vascular anastomoses between the two fetuses and, and basically one fetus shunting lots of blood towards the, um, towards the other fetus. And, um, that results in, in polyhydramnios, preterm birth, and fetal death. And so the, the kind of intervention that we do is a fetoscopic procedure with very tiny instruments. And you can see here the diameter of our instruments. It's 
um, scopes that are about two millimeters in diameter, through which we can see the placenta and we can identify the vessels that are connecting one fetus to the other. Um, as you can see in the little video clip, and then we, we burn these vessels with laser energy so that we functionally separate um, the, the two fetuses. Um, and that results in, in better chances of survival and basically cures this, uh, cures this condition. Um, the, the last procedure that is now really basically um, taking off is, is what we call um, fetal tracheal occlusion. And that's a condition that we do for fetuses with diaphragmatic hernia, where um, we know that the um, organs that herniate through a defect in the diaphragm and that sit in the chest compress the lungs and result in progressive pulmonary hypoplasia. And so these fetuses have two small lungs at birth to be able to. So we were talking about diaphragmatic hernia where um, we see progressive pulmonary hypoplasia during the course of the pregnancy. And um, we basically have developed a procedure to make the lungs grow more rapidly in utero by delivering a little balloon in the, in the fetal airway so that the lung fluid that is being produced builds up and, um, and expands the lungs before birth. And the little clip in the bottom here, that is, that is what, it, um, what it looks like in, in real life. So it's again an ultrasound and fetoscopy guided procedure where we insert a little um, a trocar, a little needle into the, into the uterus and then we identify the fetal mouth um, and you can see the lips here. Um, you can see the tongue there in the bottom. We insert the scope inside the baby's mouth. And it's basically a, a fetal intubation that we're doing there, just as what the anesthetists are doing um, every single day, but then in utero. You can see the um, epiglottis here. And then we dive behind that epiglottis with our, with our scope. Um, as, you, as you could see in the, in the animation before, we identify the vocal cords and then we pass um, a cannula in, into the trachea. And then through that cannula, we deliver a little, um, a little latex balloon that measures about um, a centimeter in width that, that really blocks the, blocks the airway, uh, prevents the lung fluid from coming out, allows the lung fluid to, to build up um, in the airway and then expands the lungs. And we know that that um, increases lung growth before birth. And these kids start off with bigger lungs and with higher chances of survival. Um, and we've just together with a couple of other international centers, um, finalized um, a big randomized trial comparing this treatment um, with expectant management. And we see that we increase the chance of survival for these kids with about 30% by doing such a procedure. So that is certainly going, going to take off um, in, the very near, uh, in the very near future. Um, and then the last kind of intervention that we, that we do, and that's now been available here in Canada for the last, um, for the last three years, um, is open fetal surgery for spina bifida. And spina bifida is basically a defect at the level of the spine that results in progressive damage to the, to the central nervous system in a, uh, to explain it in a nutshell. And um, we do know that repairing the spina bifida in utero um, improves the neurologic outcome of these kids, improves their motor function, improves their chance of walking and decreases their, their risk of ending up with hydrocephalus and a need for a ventricular peritoneal shunt. So in, in this kind of procedure, what we do is that we exteriorize the mom's uterus through a large laparotomy. And what you can see here on the, on the mom's abdomen is, is basically a uterus. Um, mom is under, um, under general anesthesia. And we then um, make uh, a very careful incision in the, in the uterus, which is uh, what we call a hysterotomy. Um, so breaking, breaking the waters and, um, and, and opening the, the amniotic membranes and then expose the, the fetal spine for, um, for our colleagues neurosurgeons who will then basically repair the fetal spine in the same way as what is done um, after birth. So they, they will um, dissect the neural placode from the, from the fetal skin and drop it back into the spinal canal and then close the, the fetal skin um, over the defect so that we get a waterproof um, area there. Um, so that the cerebral spinal fluid that sits around the spinal cord and around the brain, around the brain doesn't leak out anymore. And that allows the, the brain and the spinal cord to develop more normally without that, ongoing, um, without that ongoing damage. Now, obviously, as you can see here, these are major surgeries um, with, with the, um, and even though you will see in the, in the next few images that after the, after the surgery on the fetus, that we kind of close everything as much as possible. Um, we still end up with a with large um, uterine defect. So this, this still comes with 
significant maternal um, morbidity. Um, this comes with still a, a high risk of preterm birth, so that's certainly not the um, um, not the ideal scenario, but um, certainly results in, in much better outcomes. Um, we've done that first surgery in, in June 2017, and, and we just published a, a first series of, of about 30 cases there um, this year, um, which was a great success for, for our team, I think. Um, what I've shown you here is, is an overview of what we're doing in fetal surgery now. It's certainly not, not the end, and I think that the future will, will definitely bring us more robotics and um, different groups around the world are already working on that. We'll also um, involve a lot of artificial intelligence and, and picture reconstruction because we're working through very small endoscopes. Um, so we're losing the, the overview of, of the surgical field, but um, AI will, will probably help us there. And then we're always looking at, at less invasive procedures such as high intensity, high intensity focused ultrasound. Now, uh, maybe just one last slide to tell you how I got there. How does somebody become a fetal surgeon? As you, as you heard in the introduction, I uh, trained in Belgium. And for those who don't know where Belgium is, that's where it is on the, on the map. Um, I can highly recommend it for your next summer holiday once COVID is, is gone. Um, and then um, when I was 18, I wanted to become a fighter pilot. Um, now, for, um, the, I, I went through the exams of the, of the medical school, of the military school. And unfortunately, they disqualified me because I was not very good at handling two joysticks at the same time. Uh, they thought I wasn't good enough with my hands. Um, so um, at the same time, the medical school, medical school exams were running. So my mom told me, uh, why don't you do those two while you're not doing entrance exams? So that's how I got into medical school. And then I always wanted to do orthopedics when I was in medical school. Um, but in my last year of medical school, I had a great um, rotation of obstetrics and gynecology with a completely crazy supervisor. And that's how I ended up in, in ob -gyne. And then obviously I, I never was interested in obstetrics. I wanted to do gyne -onc and, and, and oncologic surgery. Um, but in my, um, in my second year of residency, um, one of the professors in, in my department came up with a, with a position for a PhD and asked me whether I was interested. And that's how I rolled into a PhD in, in fetal therapy um, and, and, in, um, and in obstetrics. And then during my fellowship, I wanted to go to the UK, but um, my PhD supervisor um, knew this guy here in Toronto, and, and that's how I kind of rolled into a, into a fellowship in, in Toronto, and that's how I ultimately got, um, got where I am now. So um, besides um, choosing something that you think you like now, I, I'd say keep really an open mind, and, and virtually any job can, can be interesting, and never saying no is, is often a good philosophy in terms of keeping your options open and, and finding something that you like. Thank you very much.